Good morning, Wisco family. Thank you, Mr. Raymond, for your encouragement from God's word this morning. At this time, I would like to call forward our assembly speaker, Mr. Charlie Weddle. And we have four students who will be interviewing him. If they would come forward to the chairs at center stage as well. As noted yesterday, Mr. Charlie Weddle is a historic figure in Wisconsin in that he broke the color line in stock car racing and became the first African American to be inducted into the Short Track Hall of Fame in this state. You'll notice he's the distinguished one in this picture. We are grateful that he is willing to address us this morning and talk a little bit about his life and the important message that he loves to share with young people. Once again, a round of applause for Mr. Charlie Weddle. Am I supposed to say something? You can say good morning and then Yes, good morning to all of you, and it's really a, a blessing to be here today. I've never seen so many young people in one place in my life. <laughs> but first thing I want to do is give honor to God. His amazing grace have brought me thus far. And if it had not been for the Lord, I wouldn't be here today. I've had some challenges in my life, and he's always been there to uphold me. And I say thank you, Father, for all the goodness that you've done for me down through the years. Your amazing grace has kept me. Thank you. Thank you. And you recognize the seniors before you, Cam Campbell, Taylor Carroll, Brielle Miles and uh, Larissa Roby Brown, and they have some questions for Mr. Weddle. Want to lead us off? Tell us a little about a little about yourself as a child. Speak that a little clearer. Oh, yeah. Could I you? Yeah. Go ahead. Speak loud, would you please? All right. <laughs> All right. Could you tell us a little about yourself as a child? What did he say? Oh yeah, I'd be glad to do that. If I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't tell you about my childhood, then I would be taking the Lord's blessings that He had blessed me. Um, back in the Red Hills of Tennessee, I was a little boy, and we went to work at an early age down there. And when I was 13 years old, they had me in the cotton fields, and believe me or not, I was picking 400 pounds of cotton a day at 13 years old. And that was the Lord was with me then, because a lot of times we didn't even have food to eat and to go out there and do that. But he was with me, manna was there, and even then, uh, I even had a bank account at 13 years old back in Tennessee. That was amazing. That's God's amazing grace. So, he blessed me so many ways. I remember one time I was in the field, and there's a big old black snake ran between my feet there, my legs and that, and I stepped on a big sharp piece of glass and that cut deep into my foot and I ran all the way home and my grandmother was there and she took some soot out of a chimney and some Vaseline 
and some other stuff she had, and she mixed that up, put it on my foot, and tied a bandage around it. You know, I never had to go to the doctor. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And you know, he'll do the same thing for you. I'm looking for you young people to pick up the torch and move forward. The time is running out. We need to move forward. And I'm depending on you young people to carry the torch. One blood saved us all. One blood, like Martin Luther King say, I have to say something about him. He said he was loved and, and, and what he brought forth, he want all people to be together and share love, just like Jesus want all of us to go forward and love one another. What a blessing. But, you know, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that you can't achieve. Did you have another question? Yes. So we were just wondering what led you to come to Wisconsin? What, what led you to Wisconsin? Yeah. Um, uh, it, the jobs were getting very scarce down there at that time. And my wife had an uncle up here, and he told me if I'd come to Wisconsin, he would get me a job. So he did. And uh, that's sort of what brought us here, because the lack of work down there in... Uh, we come to Wisconsin in 1953. They were still, wagons and stuff were still pulling fruit around with wagons and streetcars and stuff. So that's one of the reasons that we came here. So you spent a bunch of your childhood working. Were you able to also get an education? What did she say? She's wondering about your education since you had to work so much. What kind of education did you get? <laughs> Well, I don't, I didn't have a lot of education, you know. I started to work at 12, 13 years old, and I, I'd go in the front door, and, 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 and you'd have to go in your room and say, I'm present, and then I'd run out the back door and go to work. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it, it's, education is good, and, and that's, going to be my thing this summer, and I'm in the auto salvage business, not a big one, but all the money, half the money I make, I want to give to the young kids to get an education. Education is good. You need it. But the next thing is that don't that, that little electric box that you have in your hand lead and guide you. Uh, it, I mean, uh, technology is beautiful if you use it in the right way. But it can lead you down a road of destruction also if you don't use it in the proper way. Um, so what became your interest in racing? Like what made you become interested in racing? How did you become interested in racing? <laughs> I've become, I've always been interested in racing. It, way back years ago, when uh, they used to race at the mile track out there, me and my wife would attend all the races, you know. And I'd sit up there and look at that, and Norm Nelson and Don White and all those guys going around there. And, and I said, man, I'd like to get a hold of one of those cars. And uh, a friend of mine I work with, he... Um, asked me to come to, uh, to the races with him one evening, and I guess that turned me on, you know. But as I got into racing, I was racing when Martin Luther King was marching for equality. And I wasn't the most desirable person out there, you know. They told me that uh, we don't want you here. I said, you guys are nothing but troublemakers. And the Lord sent me there to break down a barrier. So I never did argue with the guys in that. And 
Before I left that evening, the guy told me, said, Charlie, you'll never be a race car driver. I said, no need of you coming back. But they don't know who sent me there to break down a barrier. And left there that evening. I had some white friends. Don't, I wouldn't have achieved what I achieved if it hadn't been for my white friends. And I thank them. Uh, so I went on and got used to the car and messed it around. I went to Beaver Dam one evening. I, I got a hold to the car and, and, and got it set up. I set a new track record for qualifying. I won the heat race. I turned around and won the feature. They had a 40-car demolition derby. I turned around and won that. And my message to the young people, don't ever let nobody tell you what you can or cannot do. With the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you on your way to doing anything you so to die, but do it in his name, not your name. Do it in your name. And I've won all kind of races. Raced at the mile track. Planning on racing again this year. I have a NASCAR. 87 years old, I'm planning on running that car at the fair park. And what I'm doing, I'm standing up to my word, telling young people, don't ever let nobody tell you what to do. I'm telling you, I'm leading the way. I'm going to stand up to my word. I tell you, don't ever let nobody tell you what you can or cannot do with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They can't keep you from doing what you need to do. What are some of the challenges you faced as a black man trying to compete in racing? Can you talk about some of the challenges you faced as a race car driver, a black race car driver in sure. the 60s? Well, it, it, well, I, I, I had all kind of challenges, you know, they'd run me into the wall and, and laugh about it, you know, and, uh, but again, the Lord kept me humble. He didn't put me there to run into people and that. And that's the reason why, you know, I come to be the race car driver I was. And at the, um, at the, at the, Hall of Fame thing, the last words I said that I started with a very few friends and now I have an abundance of friends. I had a standing ovation. It was many people there as it is here today and I got a standing ovation for that. That's because I, let, I kept myself humble like the Lord put me there to do. Any, was there anyone that actually motivated you to keep going and like push through the racial barrier? Was there anybody that motivated you to persevere? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ motivated me. Can't, can't beat that <laughs> Once you started racing, um, what were some of the challenges you faced then as a black man in a widely white sport? More about the challenges you faced in the racing world. Well, the challenges that I faced, you know, every time I went to the track, I had opposition. You know, one night at uh, Wilmot, Wisconsin, I won a race down there. But before I raced, that, before I won that race, some guy was losing water out of his radiator and I slid over into him and uh, I won the race. But at the end of the race, they gonna whoop me. They said, let's get him. You know, but they'd run me into the wall and, and laugh about it, but they could run me into the, you know, and, and if I hit them, not intentionally, they want to jump on me, you know, but, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took care of all of that. It never developed. Out of all the threats I had, they never touched me. Praise the Lord. Um, the next question is, how did you get your nickname, The Black Fox? I'm sorry, I, you know. It's okay. How did you get your nickname, The Black Fox? Oh, that's amazing. You know, <laughs> I... Uh, one evening, I was at Wilmot, and uh, a lot of my family 
lives with me like there is here today. And I, if you want to know anything about me and think I'm just joking about what I say, you ask some of my family members and I think they can clarify what I say. Uh, a lot of my family was there and what they done, they come down to the fence and cheered me on uh, the race I had won. And then, you know, with me having light skin and that helmet on my head and the goggles on and it was in the evening time, and then the people looked around and said, we don't really have a black guy down here racing. Uh, but I'm going to tell you how, I, that's what the next day I had a sign painter to put on my car, the Black Fox. I wanted to let them know that I was a brother. You understand? And that's where the Black Fox come from, because I want to lift up my people, you know, and what I've done, I want to do it in our name, in the Father's name. So that's where the Black Fox come from. They, I let them know the next day I went and had the black fox, and they laughed at me when I come back out there with that on. Look at that, he said, who does he think he is, you know? But it stood a sign of time. They know me all over the state of Wisconsin. They call me the black fox. What message do you want young people to know and believe based on your experiences? What message do you want young people to know and believe? on your experience? You know, when, uh, what I want you to leave here with is the, um, you know, Jesus said that um, he said, ever who will, let them come. He didn't say a white man, black man, blue man. He said, ever who will, let them come. And when you come, come with love in your heart for your fellow man. And, and, and stick together. The battle is not over yet. You young people have to pick up the torch and move forward. You know, everybody's saying this is a lost generation. It's not a lost generation. You can pick up the torch and move forward in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you had to go through this experience again, would you? If you had to go through this experience again, would you? Um, I go through experiences right now, not in the racing world. I, uh, I must have spoke out of turn, you know, and I had my trailer parked over there, and then I went there one morning, somebody had killed a pit bull and towed it to my trailer. But I kept moving on. That didn't stop me, you know. Uh, it's a lot of things you're going to have to endure in life, you know, where it's in racing or whatever. So what you have to do there again. You got to look up. That's where your help come from. And you got to be firm in what you believe in. You know, you can't be this today and something else tomorrow. When I go, I was at McDonald's one morning, and uh, there's a group of kids there, black kids, and they were talking, and well, I just walked right up in the middle of them. And uh, they looked at me, you know, what do you want? But after I told them what I uh, had achieved in that and what I believed in, and one of the young guys said, we need somebody like you to talk to us. And that's what I've been doing wherever I go. Old or young, I talk to them. I was in a junkyard one day, I carried some scrap in, and this old guy there, he was throwing stuff off his truck. And he and I got to talking about the Lord. He said, I don't know who sent you here. He said, I needed this. 
And I'm going to say one more thing here. I was in Timothy on vacation, me and my brother, and a gentleman come out of the motel there, and uh, he said his wife sent him down there to get something out of the car. And I looked at him. I said, come over here once. Let me talk to you. So he come over, and we sat there for quite a while talking. And here come his wife out of the motel, you know. She said, what's holding you up? He said, I was just talking with Charlie here. And then after she left, what he told me, he said, you made my vacation complete by talking to you. Praise the Lord. As you look back on your time in racing, what is your favorite memory? What's your favorite memory from your time of racing? Oh, boy. Well, in, in what respect, you know? Just a fond memory. What was the fun thing, fond memory of racing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I guess it's when I clean the house up there at Beaver Dam. You know, it, 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 <laughs> that was fun to me because I made the most money up there that evening. I made more, <laughs> I made more money than any guy up there that evening. And uh, I, it's a blessing, you know. And, 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 and another thing I'd like to give thanks to is St. Marcus. Let me tell you something. I gained a lot of knowledge since I've been to St. Marcus. You have some good teachers there and some people are really about the business. And they're doing a lot of good things for the inner city kids and, and I'm right in the middle of it. I would hope that I could really help them out. I have a lot of people that they pretty well off, you know, and they sort of believe in what I'm doing too. So they keeping their eyes on me. And, Hold on, St. Marcus, we're going to help these kids out to get a good education. You know, the lack of education, people can put you in bondage. You understand? They'll tell you to come get it, you know, but they ain't going to tell you what the consequences are. And without an education, you're going to run and get it. And then there you are, you know, miss one payment, telephone ring, everything's happening now. But people with knowledge, education, they don't fall for that. They can see the downfall in that. So, yes. What did, it, what did it feel like to become a Hall of Famer? What did he say? What did it feel like to become a Hall of Famer? You know, it's, it's, nearly, it's not really about me. not really about me. It's about the one who sent me to be a Hall of Famer. That's what it's all about. Give praises. Stand up. Stand up. You know, just like David did, David, if he rejoiced in the Lord. You know, if you have problems, you do like David did, rejoice in the Lord, and that'll comfort you, the problems that you're having. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord, the time of trouble. That's what David did, he rejoiced in the Lord. We just want to know, what is your favorite Bible verse? What's your favorite Bible verse? <laughs> oh, boy. That down. Yeah. Let's see. I guess I have it just right on the tip end of my tongue. I just, that. Put it in your own words. Put it in my own words. It, uh, mm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I think that's 
he illustrated that in my life, in my family's life. And I'd like to just say that I don't know how much more time we have, but let me tell you when I come in to really believing in the Lord. One time my wife and her sister and my brother-in-law, they were fellowshipping on the go to Chicago to fellowship. And I told them, I didn't have time for that. I want to go racing. So they left the kids with me. I told them to take the car and go ahead. And my daughter, two of them sitting down there, they were going to, I had a pickup, a little two-door pickup. And they were supposed to ride with me. I'm going to show you the miracle that God worked that day. Um, they were supposed to ride with me in that pickup, little old two-door pickup. And then my two nephews wanted to go, Jeffrey and Ronnie. So they got in the truck. So we took off to Lake Geneva to race. And halfway down there, down Highway 36, a car come out of the side road and hit me in the door. The truck rolled over. They said they heard this noise five miles down the road, all that iron scraping in that. I got a gash in the head. Two nephews didn't even have to go to the hospital. And my two daughters would have been in that truck with me if my two nephews hadn't have gone. And if one of the daughters had a got killed in there, what a burden. But he was there. And that's when I started to serve in the Lord. Like Paul, I got knocked off my beast. And then I knew that the Lord said, now is the time. And then from then on, I grabbed my kids and, and led them to church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sitting in the front here is Vicki. Since my wife has, she tells me what to do now, you know. <laughs> John, my grandson, he's very musical inclined, and I hope I can send him to music school. This kid is, is, is a brilliant music. He can sit down at a piano and write a song. And that's my other daughter, Robin. Robin and I always been the tricky ones. We'd pull fast things, and, and then my wife and Vicky would get on us, you know, but me and Robin had it hooked up. And then we have Jason over there, my grandson, and, uh, and my brother Cliff. Cliff is a friend. He's a friend indeed. Always there to help me for anything I want him to do. Likewise to him. Oh, who's there? Oh, Mark is another one of my grandsons. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Mark. All right. You know, I had Channel 4 come out last week and did a thing on me, uh, my racing career, so that'll be coming out in the next day or two. It'll be on Channel 4. And uh, I told him about Mark. I'm glad you brought Mark up, Mark had a little boy, and when Mark was a young man, he'd come over and eat, and he'd always be telling my uh, wife, more cornbread, more cornbread. He'd like to eat a lot of cornbread, so he ended up make, naming his little boy cornbread. <laughs> so so <laughs> he's going to be my poster boy this year. Cornbread's going to be my poster child. Well, we welcome your family as well and it it was uh, an honor to have you here today thank you thank you so much for thank fitting you. us into your schedule thank you. thank you
Did you have one more announcement about pictures? Oh, yeah. Now, <laughs> these ladies and gentlemen here, I have some pictures like you've seen on that in race cars. Uh, in the room, this lady here. And uh, I want to sign those pictures and give them to you for being so nice to come up and talk with me. Thank you again, Mr. Whittle, and especially for your strong witness and to the sustaining power in your life, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being an attentive audience. You are dismissed. And, and, and tell them how old I am. I'm not ashamed. 87? 87 years old.